In this tutorial, we're going to model a vehicle. In this case, it's a Dodge Ram 1500. So we're going to rig it using rigid bodies and shapes and constraints and material. We're going to set up the steering uh, using C-sharp scripting. And we're also going to create a dry train where we step-by-step step take it towards a more realistic dry train. So if we browse the internet, we will find a lot of specification for these kinds of vehicles. So we need to understand the overall mass, the overall size, how much each tire weighs, the rim, and also something about the engine. What is the overall uh, specification of the engine, such as uh, torque, etc. Uh, we're going to use the gear ratios, and we're also going to use some other properties, which are, will be very important when we want to define this machine. The steering will be a fairly simple Ackerman steering, even though this specific vehicle has a rack and pinion steering. The first thing we need to do is to make sure that the model has the correct size. One way to do that is to actually create a, a bounding cube, which has the correct specification for this vehicle. And then we just drag the model into the scene and make sure that it actually fits. And we have a pretty good fit for, for that. So, we can just remove this cube here. And we can also remove this model because we're going to use a prefab. Uh, and also what's really important is that we need to enable this read-write. That's really important. So here we have the scaling, which makes this 3D model in the correct size. But we also need to read-write enable the, the mesh so that we can extract mesh data that later on when we want to create collision shapes. So now we have done that. What I've also done is that I've created prefab. Uh, the reason for this is that sometimes we need to organize the model so that it actually works for dynamic simulation. In this case, we know that the chassis is one solid rigid body and each wheel is one rigid body. But in our case, we're actually going to simulate the tire and the rim separately. So we need to make sure that we have a hierarchy where we can add the rigid body for each of these moving parts. So let's go ahead and add rigid bodies for each and every one of these game objects. So we have the chassis, we have the rim for one of the tires, and we do that for all of these four tires. And then we can add a rigid body. If we now start the simulation, we should see uh, the vehicle just falling down in gravity, which is what we should expect. Next, what we need to do is add geometry or something that can collide. In our case, we are going to use a primitive cylinder for this. So if we go here and we select the left front tire, we can see that it's a rigid body because we just added that. And it also has this tool, which makes it possible to click a mesh and select a primitive, and we'll get automatically get a perfect fit here. So in this case, we're going to create a cylinder so now we can see that this rigid body has a cylinder with a specific radius and that it's a perfect fit for this tire. We can see that the radius was uh, 0.41 meter and that corresponds pretty well to a 17 inch rim with the default tire. Now we also need to do the same procedure for all of the tires. So to test this now, what we're going to do is that we're going to select the car, move it up and create a ground box that will make pretty big like this. And then when we start the simulation, we should see the tires colliding. Now we also want the rim to follow the tire when it's moving. So the way we can handle this is to select the top level game object for both the tire and the rim then we're going to add a two body tire component. And we can see that they require two rigid bodies. So if we select the first wheel here, and then we just drag the tire to this field and the rim to that one. And then we have to do that for all of the tires. So if we start the simulation, we're going to see that the tire and the rim are actually falling together as one. Now, there is more to this tire model than just a constraint combining the tire and the rim. 
We also have the friction direction, which is being updated by this two body tile model. We have a forward direction, always uh, oriented along the rotational direction of the tire. And we have a secondary friction direction, which is orthogonal to the first. Uh, and this is important because when we later on specify the friction, we can have different friction in the forward direction and in the orthogonal direction. We can also have different slip in these two directions. We also need to create some properties for the tire model. So if we select each and every one of the game objects for the tires, we can create a new asset on disk. And if we select that, we can see that we have a number of parameters here. We have the stiffness and damping for each of the degrees of freedom of the tire relative to the rim. The four degrees of freedom for the tire model is the radial stiffness and damping in this plane here. We have the lateral stiffness and damping along this axis, bending stiffness, and finally torsion stiffness and damping. We're going to set some values which gives us a plausible simulation behavior. Before we test the tire model and the settings that we have been using, we also have to make sure that uh, the mass of the chassis is correct and that we also have a constraint between each of the rim against the chassis. So first we're going to set up the rated body for the chassis. And if we select this uh, game object here, we can see that it has a mass of one. And it doesn't really have any shapes because we haven't added any shapes. So if we select the chassis here, we can see that it consists of lots and lots of mesh objects. And uh, we need to select some of these or create new shapes that will have represent this chassis in terms of uh, uh, volume. In this case, we're going to choose a number of these meshes and we're going to remove a few of them because we know that, well, the steering wheel, the window, the side mirror, they don't contribute that much to the volume. So we're going to try to select things that actually contribute to the volume of this whole machine. And there are some specific meshes that we're going to use here. So now we can see that we have sort of a rough selection of, of the valid or the relevant uh, meshes. And what we're going to do here is add mesh. And then we can see that for each of these, we have been have chosen the source of the mesh that corresponds to the selected uh, mesh here. So now if we go up to the chassis, we can see that it has computed a mass, but this mass is too large. And the reason for that is that the computed volume versus the density will generate a too large mass. But what we can do is that we can uncheck this and then we can add the number of kilos that we would like this chassis to weigh. So the specification says something like 3.3 ton. So let's go ahead and use that. So now we have a rated body of the chassis with a specific mass. It has some computed uh, inertia diagonals and, and also center of mass. The next thing we need to do is to add constraints between each of the rims to the chassis. To model the steering and suspension of this vehicle, we're going to use something called cylindrical joint. That will allow a translation up and down, but also a rotation for the steering. But to do this, we will need one additional radial body for each tire. And the reason for this is that we also need a hinge. So we have the rim that should rotate around a certain axis and that should be connected to a body and that body should be connected to the chassis via a cylindrical joint. So let's go ahead and create a small rated body that lies behind this rim. So if we first focus on the left front wheel here, we're going to use a small trick to position this rigid body. So we create a new rigid body and that ends up in the top of the hierarchy here. We go down here and we change the size. We're also gonna disable the collision for this box because we don't need it to collide with anything. And then we're also going to set the mass to something like five kilos. Now we can see that this rigid body has the complete wrong position. We want it to be positioned here inside of the tire. So what we're going to do is we're going to drag it and drop it inside 
of one of the, for example, inside of the rim. So now we have this shape here, the left front tire, and it has a mesh. And inside of that, we have a rigid body. Now, this is not valid. You'd never have a rigid body as a child of another rigid body, but this is only for the positioning phase. So if we now remove all the translation data here, we'll see that it ends up at the correct position. And then we move it up to the top of this group here. So now we can see that we have the left front wheel, we have the left front tire, we have the left front rim, and then we also have this steering body. So let's call it steering body, which is positioned inside of the rim. So next we're going to create a hinge between this body and the rim. So we select this tool here and we're going to use the axis. We click this box, select the box, we find an axis, we find a position inside of this box, we choose the direction like that. And then we have to select the other ready body, which should be the rim. So left front rim is the one we want. We have to select it to be a hinge and then we click create. So now we have a hinge between this box here and the rim. The next step is to create a cylindrical joint between this box and the chassis. So once again, we have selected this ready body. We can choose to create a constraint. We select cylindrical joint. We select axis, click on the box. Doesn't really matter which one we choose. We take this one and we try to find the center axis, the vertical center axis. Select a point at the center. We select the direction. And then we select the other ready body, which should be anything on this chassis here. We can see that it's chassis ready body. And we click create. So now we have both a hinge, which will be used for uh, the driving, braking, but we also have a cylindrical joint, which is uh, going to help us with the suspension. And in this case, we're going to set it to two times 10 to the power of minus five for the compliance, which is the stiffness and 0 0.1 for the damping. And obviously if you have your own values for, for your specific vehicle, you can enter them here. So now we're going to use the linear lock for the suspension and we're going to use the rotational lock for steering. So we enable that. And we're also going to enable the range so that we can control the amount of rotation for each direction for the steering. And we're going to use minus 0.4 and plus 0.4 radians. So now we should be able to rotate the tire left and right. Before we go ahead and configure the other tires, we're going to rename the constraints in a consistent way because we are going to use these later on. So let's call this left front hinge and this one is called left front suspension. We're also going to disable collision with one mesh here that might cause interference because it's sort of uh, penetrating this box here and also the, the tire model. So let's uh, disable collision for that mesh. And now we are ready to configure the rest of the tire. It's a good idea to be consistent when modeling the constraints, especially when choosing the primary ready body, the secondary ready body the rotational axis, the anchor point, and the rotational direction. The reason for this is that when we're using the hinge as a motor later on, it would be great if we can just set a positive direction to get the vehicle to move forward. Also try to use a consistent naming for the constraints so we can find them easier later on. Now we are ready to start the simulation and see what happens. So we can see that we actually have suspension on all the wheels. Uh, we also have the tire model, but we should absolutely disable the rendering of these boxes. So we can go down here and they all have uh, a visual representation that we just disable. So we can do that for all of the boxes. To control the car, we're going to add a very basic controlling script. So if we attach this to the parent game object, we can see that it's named basic vehicle controller and it has two parameters, speed and steering. 
If we start the script and we change the speed, we can see that the vehicle moves forward and backward. If we change the steering value, we can see that we actually control the lock position of the rotational part of the suspension joint. So let's have a quick look into the script. We can see that we have an array of hinges, an array of cylindrical uh, constraints. We have the two public parameters. We get all the constraints where the name contains uh, all the hinges uh, where the name constraint uh, contains the name front. And we also get all the cylindrical joints in the whole vehicle. And we know that we only have cylindrical joints in the front. In the back, we're using a prismatic joint for suspension. What we also do is that we enable the motor for these hinges because we're going to use them as a motor. And in the update loop, we're actually going to set the speed of the hinges and set the target position of the cylindrical joints, only the rotational part of the cylindrical joint. So that's all. That's a very basic controlling script. But we can quickly imagine that this is not the way a real vehicle works, because first of all, we don't have any uh, Ackerman steering meaning that the angle of these tires will be wrong. So if you drive a little bit faster, you will get skipping motion of the car. Secondly, we don't have any differential on, on the motor because we have two separate motors, both driving at the same time. So when you are turning, you will actually get very strange skipping motion because of that. So to get a better control of this vehicle, we need to have a better steering and a better drivetrain. For the next level of uh, drivetrain and steering, we're going to use a script called Ackerman Steering that we'll have a look at later, and also Car Drivetrain. So we attach both of these to the same game object. And we're going to disable this basic vehicle controller because we don't need it anymore. And we can see that uh, the Ackerman Steering has a param parameter steering, and that's the one we're going to use for steering this vehicle. And we also have some parameters here for the Ackerman algorithm. Next, we have the car drivetrain and we need two constraints. So we're going to use front hinge. So we're going to take the left front hinge and drop it here and the right front hinge and drop it there. So now we have all the parameters that we need for this script to be uh, running. So if we start the simulation, we shouldn't see that much happening except for the vehicle perhaps moving a little bit. But the reason why it's not moving is because we have a gearbox here. If we, so if we put in the first gear and we enable the clutch and then we set some target speed and this is actually the target speed in RPM for the engine. So it's not a really a realistic engine uh, at this point and we can change the direction like this. And if we make it higher, it goes faster. And we can set the speed to zero. We can also have a look at the steering. You can see that if we change the steering here, we get uh, the Ackerman controlling and computing the angle of the two tires so that we get a correct steering degree. So all that is working just fine. So we stop the simulation and then we open first the Ackerman steering script. So we see that we have this public float variable steering, and that is the one we use for input. And then we have a, a method that is just computing the output angle for left and right steering based on the wheelbase, the distance between the wheels, and the steering ratio and this Ackerman percentage, which are two of the uh, additional parameters. So this can be found on the web, and I actually used uh, ChatGPT to create this code for me. Uh, and we do the same thing here. We find the cylindrical joints. We also find uh, some bodies here, uh, the left front tire, the right front tire, and the right rear tire. And we use those three bodies to compute the wheel distance and the wheelbase. And we'll use that as an input to this Ackerman uh, algorithm. And then during runtime, every uh, tick of the loop, we will compute the steering based on this input. 
and get the output angles and send that to the uh, rotational part of the cylindrical joints. So that's all the Ackerman steering is doing. And let's have a look at the drivetrain. Now, this is a simplified drivetrain, but it has a number of parameters, which we can see here. Uh, and uh, it has a number of gears. And in the initialization of this script, we are calling something called create a drivetrain. And the full drivetrain looks like this. We will create a hinge with a motor. That is our simplified engine. Now, this could be a combustion engine or an electrical engine or something else. But in this case, we're going to make it fairly simple, ideal hinge motor. We can control the target speed of this hinge. So basically, we can control the RPM. Uh, it's connected to a shaft and then it's connected to a dry clutch. And we use the clutch to, to release between the engine and the rest of the drivetrain. We have another shaft and then we have the gearbox and an output shaft. And then we connect that to a differential. Uh, we need a differential between the left and the right uh, hinge because otherwise we'll get this skipping motion when we're trying to steer. So this differential connects to uh, what we call the a rotational actuator connected to the left hinge, another rotational actuator connected to the right hinge. So the rest of the code here is just boilerplate to set this up. Here we also create the gear ratios and we set some capacitives of the dry clutch. Uh, so this code is pretty straightforward. And then during uh, runtime, we get the target speed converted to radians per second and set the target speed to the motor the motor that we're using as an engine here. We also set a uh, force range. Now we could have a lookup table changing the available torque depending on the uh, RPM. So we get a more realistic uh, engine model. And also we control the clutch. We control the lock of the differential. So that's also a parameter here. And then we also set the gear and we get some output uh, in terms of the RPM for the tires and the speed of the tires. So that's the whole code for controlling and uh, accessing the vehicle drivetrain. We're also going to create some material between the tires and the ground. So we create a shape material for the tire and also for the ground. And then we're going to create the contact material that defines the interaction. And here we're also going to use a friction model so we can specify direct friction for this interaction. So now when we have created the material, we can assign them to the geometries. So we take the ground material and drop that onto the ground. And we select all the cylinders that we use for tires and we use the higher material and drop that here. So now we have all we need to simulate this vehicle. As a final step to this model, we have added a texture on the ground and we also have an environment map for the sky. And we also have done some minor changes uh, so that we can actually see the current torque of the motor. And finally, we have added a car keyboard control. So if we open that script, we can see that it has access to the Ackerman steering and the car drivetrain, the classes that we just investigated. And we're accessing that through the current components. And then we use keyboard input to determine if we have the up arrow pressed, and then we'll select a gear. We'll set some target speed on the engine. Once again, there's an RPM for the uh, engine and we will engage the clutch. If we release the up key, we will set the target speed to zero, so we'll get some braking effect. And then we have down arrow if we want to uh, reverse. And then we also have a get key down for uh, left arrow and right arrow, meaning that we are steering right and steering left. And if we release the right or the left, 
we reset the steering to zero, so we drive forward. Uh, we have also enabled page up and page down so we can switch gears. So if we go to this method, we'll see that it will just switch to the next available gear or switch to the previous gear. And in the code for the drivetrain, what we've done is that we're reading out the uh, force or the torque that the motor is currently applying. There is also a few more things that we have modified. So if we take front suspension and we look at the lock, we have limited the available force or torque in this case for the rotation so that we don't have infinite force for steering because otherwise we'll get some instability based on that. We have also added some damping. So if we start the simulation, we can see that if I change the direction, it's not acting immediately. There is some delay or some slugginess to the steering, which is good because we don't want the tire to turn too fast. Now, if you have a gamepad or you have a different controller device, uh, you might change this the way you want. But this is uh, helping a lot. So now if we press the key, we can see that the vehicle is driving and we have also attached a camera to the chassis object here so we can follow the car. If I want to, if I select this up here and then continue to drive, we can see that we can also switch gear to second gear to third gear. And here we can see the uh, torque that is being applied uh, from the engine. So if I now release the button, we'll see that it's applying the maximum torque of 365 Newton meter to brake and stop the car and we can start the car again like this and if i want to go backward we just press backward and then it's applying maximum torque in the reverse direction so now we have created a vehicle uh, with um, a more complicated drivetrain with Ackerman steering and with suspension before we start the final simulation we can see that i've added some bumps and also a jump over here but we're also going to add something called the simulation object. We talked about that in the previous uh, tutorial. And what we're going to do is that we're going to switch from fixed update, which means that we are using the unity frequency for update in physics. And instead, I'm going to use the update loop. And we're going to specify a frequency of 100 hertz or one millisecond time step. And the reason for that is that these tires will have a fairly high uh, rotational speed higher than we can handle in 50 hertz. With 100 hertz, we should be able to drive something around 70 kilometers per hour with a robust result. So let's start the simulation and let's accelerate. And we're also going to select the Chrysler here so we can see which gear we're using. And we're switching into sixth gear so we can pass the jump over here. like that, no problems at all. So this concludes the tutorial for modeling a, dry, a car with a dry train and with Ackerman steering inside of Unity using Ajax Dynamics for Unity. Hope you enjoyed the tutorial and see you in the next one. Thank you.